Actually, my reason, one of my main reasons to join AdWorld, and I don't mind sharing like a fanboy moment, was you'll get to interview Seth Godin. And some of them, you know, were like not necessarily my friends, but people that I was uh, acquainted to, um, or people like Carl Weisse, a lot of them I actually got to meet in the process. And yeah, it was, it was really interesting. It shows you the companies that are visiting your website. If you're a commerce store owner, you might say, why would I need that? But think about what kind of businesses or stores or brands are already inside your website and they're purchasing, or they're just checking out your products and not purchasing that instead of trying to go cold of people and brands that are not aware of you, you actually reach out to the people that are already on your website. So our B2B takes it a step further, that's why it's crazy. It, it doesn't just give you the companies, it gives you LinkedIn profiles of the people visiting. But what I'm seeing like again and again is people tend to plateau at the, at the level of the game that they feel comfortable with. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Two Ecom Experts. I'm Victor, the founder of Mercademix Ecom Expert, and I have another Ecom Expert, a really great one that I'm very excited to welcome to our podcast. It's Bill Statopoulos, and I think that I nailed it right this time. Um, a great expert, someone that was around the Ecom world, actually, the Ad World Pro, um, for a very long time. Uh, he has interviewed some of the biggest names in the marketing world. And uh, yes, today you're going to be on the other side. And um, I will be the, the one asking the questions and you'll be the one that's uh, going to be answering those. Uh, a great B2B expert, which is something very interesting for uh, the e-com world. And uh, yes, Bill, what, what did I miss? What would you say to the people that still don't know you, who is Bill and what should they know about you? Not that many more things. I'm, I'm bad at these things, man. Like, honestly, I always leave it to the, to the other person. Not that, not that many more things. I'm really passionate about marketing and growth. Uh, B2B has attracted my kind of uh, viewpoint for the last five years. Uh, all different angles of it, like how can we grow a business using like B2B tools, marketing and sales tools, marketing automation. So it's that, being a digital nomad for four years, uh, decided to settle uh, end of last year. I've uh, been literally, all of my stuff used to fit in a, in a large suitcase, whether you believe it or not. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Nice, nice guy. Okay. I mean, I'll try not to do it. <laughs> so I, I, I would, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, um, let's get things started. Uh, you were part of AdWorld Pro. I think that that's a big highlight for everyone that's doing any type of e-com. Um, and um, that's quite important. So, what were you doing in AdWorld Pro? What was your main purpose there? Yeah, so I stuck the company behind uh, AdWorld, Ecom World, CreatorsConf, and Affiliate World. Um, had existed for a while before COVID. And then when COVID hit, the main business model was doing in-person events, which, you know, as we all know, was not really viable. So they, they, yeah. they were really quick to think and on their feet. And AdWorld actually became kind of the, the product of COVID plus the ability to organize a conference. So literally within a, a period of like a year almost, because I joined in the first, in the, in the, after the first AdWorld had taken place, March 2021, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, we managed to build the largest marketing conference in the world in terms of the lineup, in terms of the people joining, uh, and in terms of you know the the other sides of the event. So that's 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 how we kind of like started. Started like not really humbly necessarily, but as in the sense that there was a, a lot of good advertising done around it, and I was lucky enough uh, to be able to join at a moment where the lineup still. You know, needed work, so I got you know my hands dirty, reviewing kind of like latest experts, inviting people. Some of them, you know, were like not necessarily my friends, but people that I was uh, acquainted to, um, or people like Carl Weiser. A lot of them I actually got to meet in the process, and yeah, it was it was really interesting. It was a really interesting journey. Everyone on my team loves Caro, and he's a good friend of ours. So, yeah, we were working, uh, we, we knew Carl even before he became so famous. He was part of the podcast as well, did a fantastic interview with him. Um, so, yeah, thank you for bringing su such amazing uh, people to Edward Pro and like making them even more famous, um, spotlighting them. Um, but for yeah. me, it's really interesting to see this. Um, 
you go in inside the trenches, you start working with those people, they seem so flashy everywhere. Some of them are the gurus of our e-com world or yeah. the marketing world, and they look all shiny and great. However, what, what changed in your perspective when you started speaking with such people? What did you learn from them? Literally, my reason, one of my main reasons to join AdWorld, that I don't mind sharing like a fanboy moment, was you'll get to interview Seth Godin. And Seth Godin like, had yep. read most of his books. He, he is like a marketing genius. He's like the godfather of marketing by many means. Yep. Uh, Sales Captain, which I work at, you know, they, we do call email. Like Seth Godin was one of the people who pioneered the use of email marketing. Like he's the guy who yep. started like that. So, you know, it was literally the pitch for me to join uh, AdWorld. And it, it was an interesting one as well because, you, you know, you get to see behind the curtain. And um, there was a big transition. Like, I think I got to interview Seth two or three times. The, the, the journey from the first interview where, you know, I was literally uh, an anxious, holding my breath, to the third one when I decided to be a bit more freestyle and I was like, okay, I'll have five basic questions and each interview lasted for about like half an hour. We aimed to record mm -hmm. 30, 40 minutes. And I was like, okay, I'll have five basic questions. And then because he also doesn't, same as with this interview, he doesn't want to know the questions in advance. So it's all quite freestyle. I was like, I'll wing it. So whatever happens, I really enjoy these conversations. So whatever happens, I'll just go with the flow. And during the recording, we caught that. We obviously removed it from the end one. He mentioned that this was his favorite interview that he had done with that world uh, since the first time. Amazing. Amazing. So what did you learn from him? What did you learn from Seth? Yeah, a, a lot of interesting things. Like with Seth, we touched on, on like broader things, marketing, being a creator, uh, what is the creative mm -hmm. process like? The, the guy literally touches on like the foundations of marketing. And then one of the quotes, because we ended up discussing some more kind of day-to-day -day things, AI, uh, we saw the boom of AI and I had an interview with him. So I was like, okay, should marketers be afraid of AI? He's actually the one during that interview who said, it's, you shouldn't be afraid of AI, you should be afraid of other marketers using AI, which mm. if you look around is actually what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's like who's using the weapon the right way. Exactly. Yeah. AI is not going to become autonomous, hopefully not for like an, the next four or five years. But oh, for sure. you know, in the meantime, you, someone has to use it. So if you're not using it, if it's not part of your tool stack, you're left behind and people who actually know how to use it. Uh, will perform much, much better. It's helped us tremendously for sales captain, any marketing project almost that I've uh, taken part in. Great, and I'll be, I'll be asking you many questions in regards to, to the e-com world because that's, the, um, that's typically our, our, our topics here, but um, you left that world pro quite recently actually. So what are you focused on right now? What's, what's happening in your life at the moment? Yeah, so uh, sales captain in kind of one word. So focusing on helping businesses grow through B2B, whether that's cold email, which is one of the things that we're really good at, or paid advertising, mm -hmm. because B2B brands, or in general, people when they're trying to sell to B2B audiences, they typically think that they need a salesperson, which is true, but they also need mm -hmm. to be doing some form of marketing. So one way or another, you need to be doing something. Typically, we forget about it, especially because the the deal sizes are much longer, the sales cycle is much yeah. longer. It's not like direct to consumer where, you know, you can even see the conversion happening in, in like the span of a month. Uh, deal size, you know, uh, 50K plus a year might take two to three months to close. So yeah. it takes like a different kind of way of like, okay, you have to first lure people in, you have to do the lead generation, but then you have to have also like a set of follow-up activities, webinars, you know, email, email flows, a lot of other things in the back end to sort of convert people. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not unlike, that, that, that's what I like. Once you understand the basics, you have user acquisition, you have activation if you're software, and then you have sales. Once you understand the basics, then you're able to build what I call like recipes for different types of businesses relatively easily. Yeah, so it's, it's sales happening, it's growing the business. It's been around for a while. Uh, being part of AdWorld was really helpful because I actually got to cold email Arena Huffington. Uh, I got to cold email Satya Nadella. I got to cold email Scott Galloway's team. And these people ended up being speakers at that world. And I ended up interviewing them. So it was like I had the business and I actually got to execute on like cold email. Like that was, that's the approach that I used. We had a good offer, obviously, becoming a speaker at the largest marketing conference is a good, yeah. it's a good offer. 
Yeah. But it was like hands on and it was real proof that the process worked. So it was really logical for me as the business was growing that I would focus like all of my attention there. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's being part of that journey, generating responses and getting some, some calls booked with some really large companies. Um, we have my co-founder's other business. It's an e-commerce agency. Like we've gotten them calls booked with some of the largest brands, direct to consumer brands in the US. Like they had a call booked with Gap. They have one more with Skims. It, it's, been, it's been a crazy ride. And all of that was like in the period of like a month. Okay. Okay. So um, I want to get into a big topic that seven, eight-figure e com store owners are really blind about, typically. And that's having sales processes inside of your e com brand. Because what's happening most of the times, um, I would say that in my, from my perspective and what, from what I've seen so far, um, typically e com brands are separated, especially the newer ones, are separated into two parts. Number one is like marketers who are like great at doing, um, doing ads get a product and they scale it up like crazy and yeah and they scale it as much as they can that's it then the second one is someone with some type of manufacturing finds a way finds people to build that business either through retail or either through ads again and they scale it up but in none of those is in any form or way is any type of sales process connected nothing like none of this is happening and all of us get stuck at some point, we get stuck at seven figures, we get stuck at eight figures, we get stuck at whatever figures. Typically, it's seven or eight. It's, if you get stuck at nine figures, you're okay, probably. You won't be like, <laughs> you, you'll be okay <laughs> being stuck there. <laughs> but we're typically getting stuck. And I can say, I, I have a, I skipped to seven figures in six months with my own e-com brand. And um, I have an e-com agency. And I understand advertising. Um, but at some point I was like, okay, I cannot just do more Facebook ads and get more money. That's, that's not working. So what are the biggest misconceptions that you've seen so far from working with those people, from speaking to those people on, on ad world or whatever? Um, what, what's typically missing there? I think there's, uh, I, uh, to borrow like Eric Sue's uh, book and kind of like philosophy, I said the same way. I, I think of it as like as a, as a game, video game. And there's different levels of the game. At every different level, you have to master a different skill. And mm -hmm. you, you, you come across a different boss at the end of every level. Yep. If you're able, you know, and, th and then it's up to you, right? So I see it in my own journey. I've had people that started working with me during the same time at a growth marketing agency. One of them was a friend, a copywriter. He remained a copywriter for the, for the, the rest of his life. As far as I've known him, like five or six years now, He's been a copywriter. Sure, he went on to work at Ogilvy and some of the largest advertising brands, but he's still a copywriter. So he's still at the executioner level. There were other people that, you know, maybe started like a freelance job and they're still there. And then there's one or two more, more people that started an agency. But what I'm seeing like again and again is people tend to plateau at the, at the level of the game that they feel comfortable with. Maybe it's because they don't want to face the boss. Maybe it's because they enjoy playing that, playing that game. Maybe it's because the game itself was never the end goal. So they realize that, hey, I'm making enough money. I'm okay where I am. Uh, and it's hard to motivate someone to go from like eight to nine figures, right? Like it's, you're comfortable mm -hmm. enough. You've solved like the basic issues in life. So unless you have like a curiosity for like, what's the next level? What does it hold for me? Um, sometimes it's, it's hard to do that because it will, you'd have to start by saying to someone who's, who's been quite successful by all measures of modern society, which is making money is like a, a pretty good uh, measure, you'd have to tell them, hey, you're not successful enough because you're not making, you know, X amount of money on the next level. So I think the first mm -hmm. step is like having the humility to realize that there's more to the game that you're probably not doing. That's the first step. And I understand it's not marketing, but the question you ask is, yep. it's not about the marketing channels because unless you're able to admit that to yourself and take a step back and look at things and say, okay, where is the issue in the business that we're not getting? Is it not, you know, not getting enough traffic, not getting enough sales? We don't have enough distribution points. We need broader market awareness. Is it that the product itself is not scalable or that we need to build a product line or that we need to add more products? So you, you first have to, have to take a step back. And then I think the biggest kind of lever in that kind of space 
is collaborations and partnerships. And I see that at the individual level, you know, you can only go as um, far enough as a solo contributor. You need to build a team. Similarly, when you're growing your business, you'd have to go to the next level, which might mean getting funding and setting up the foundations to become either a national or an international brand and an actual brand name. And that also includes partnering up with specific companies, having your products available at retail locations. I think it's it's different levels, right? It's different levels in the game. So it's like, okay, mm-hmm. you can only do so much with like good marketing skills and running marketing with like one or two people, right? Like, because how many people would you have at that stage? And then you have to say, okay, what does the next level look like? What do I need in order to be able to increase my awareness? Because marketing and sales is not, you know, it's not, it's not a complicated thing. It's like market message, audience channel. That's it. If you play the game right, it converts. So we have to obviously speak to larger parts of the, of the market and we have to do that mm-hmm. in channels that scale much better. That's it. Kanye did it with a with an ad shot on his iPhone, and he purchased you know a Super Bowl ad, and he sold out. Yeah, many ways to go about it. There's there's not yeah. one thing, but I think it starts by saying, okay, I do want to do it, so I'll take the time to go look at what needs to change, and then go in that direction. And it probably needs you know going back to the drawing board, going back and and you know putting on the hat of like, okay, I have to learn. What do I need to learn this time? That's quite interesting. Um, when, if we take again this um, hypothesis that most of the, the brands that are listening to us right now uh, have scaled through typical marketing means. So maybe it's, it's ads, it's Facebook, it's Google, it's whatever, it's TikTok, or maybe they grew organically through those platforms, whatever. Uh, but it's, it's a, again, message, audience, and channel. That's it. No, nothing more. What are the next levels? What are the low hanging next levels that we should be aware of? Because I, I can I can easily say that most e com brand owners are really stuck and really blind when it comes to potential growth. We know how to grow and we, we can think of hundreds of ways of potentially how to grow on Facebook, not all, but about hey, you can bypass this and you can get a whole new market or a whole new thing. So what are those levels that we should be looking at? The first one is retention and repeat purchase, right? You already have those people. Mm -hmm. So can your product have an add-on, an extension, a new version, whatever it is that gets people to buy again? Because in in that process, Mm -hmm. and we all know the basics, it's easier to get someone to buy again from you, especially if they've had a good experience with the product than it is to bring someone new to the business. So that's the first step. And then the second one is because all the channels that we've discussed so far are online, right? And there's a whole new level when you're bringing that offline. So I think it starts by, again, going back to the drawing board and seeing what what it's going to take to build this into an actual retail brand. Now, whether it means we'll go and partner with retail stores or existing locations or existing stores that sell similar products or stores that sell um, you know, products that are compatible to what we share, but are complementary, or whether it's opening up our own store because we have you know, the um, uh, capacity to do it. I wanted to say the balls to do it, but I don't know if, you, I don't know if we can do that. Yeah. We can say that, okay. Sure. We can say that, we can. Okay. Well, you're from Greece, I'm from Bulgaria, we can. <laughs> right, that's true, Bal- Balkans, Balkans. Uh, Balkans. Balkans. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it at the end of the day. And truly, okay. look at, um, you know, things like brands like Superdry are doing, like they have their drops, people are lining up in front of the stores. Quite interesting, because you mentioned partnerships a few times already. Um, and I don't need, like, we don't really think about partnerships that much when someone in, in our industry, industry is talking about partnerships, it's typically partnerships with influencers. <laughs> and it's like, hey, let's get a new influencer, and that's a partnership. Um, but you, you talk about retail, and you talk about, okay, two ways, either through retail stores or building your own. Let's, let's take the first hypothesis, if we don't have the big balls, and uh, yeah. it's smarter to, to go with this one uh, right. at, at first. Um, yeah. What what are the steps? How do we even approach this? 
Yeah, so the first one is mapping out your market. You probably already have the data. That's the good thing about where you are as a, as a business owner, if you're already there, is you already have the data. You already know where your customers mm -hmm. are coming from. You pretty much already know what their interests are. And if, if you don't know, you, can, you should, but if you don't, you can figure it out. So identifying what other brands they like, what other stores do they typically visit? Where do they buy when they purchase mm -hmm. online? I think this is the obvious next step that you can take. You don't have to do anything crazy. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, you definitely don't, want, you don't have to open your own store, but you can look at existing stores that sell, you know, multiple products or multiple brands mm -hmm. and see how you can get there. Also, you know, why not be on online, other online commerce businesses that, you know, resell other brands. There's a lot of different ways yeah, to go about it. And then the next step is how do you execute, right? And that's where it gets really interesting. And that's, you know, the, what excites me about cold email because typically, an e-commerce business would, would would maybe get a salesperson, but they wouldn't even do that. So with like the marketing skills that we have, they would get a salesperson and that salesperson would try to figure out how do we email like one by one the people at the other end, you know, the retail yeah. partner that we want yeah. to have, the stores, the malls, whatever it is. And you can opt in for doing that or you can do it the smart way, the marketer's way and do a cold email campaign where you go on Google Maps, you add a few keywords. What kind of businesses do I want to target? I want to, let's say, do apparel brands. Okay. Yeah. Do we want to segment those brands, let's say, by the, the type of brands they sell or by the types of, you know, products or audiences they cater to? Mm -hmm. uh, thankfully, in 2024 and, and, and beyond, there's tools that, like Clay and also other AI enrichment tools that allow us to automatically go to the website and classify the business in specific niches and sub-niches and also get ideas about what kind of products they sell, what kind of lines they're into, what regions they belong to. So it's, mm -hmm. again, even if you do it the most basic way, go on Google Maps, figure out the first 10 stores, find the details of the owner, reach out. And if you do that at scale, it's really easy to scale. <laughs> okay. Not intended. Um I definitely want to touch base on this. Um, I'm, I've been writing down a lot of stuff uh, from what you're uh, saying. I've uh, been saying that, yeah. Because that's, uh, that's quite in interesting. Because, yeah, you know, you know your customers, where they're coming from, etc. Um, and you have existing products. So how do you approach this? So you, you make a database and you start cold emailing, uh, you, you start cold emailing some uh, physical stores. Like... Take me through that process. Take me to what a professional B two B guy like you would yeah. do if you, yeah, if you want to go. Let's say we're selling in the states or we're selling in Australia, whatever, and we we want to go to retail stores. What's what's that like? So it's building the data set, building the the actual prospect list that you're going to reach out to, creating the messaging, mm -hmm. setting up the email accounts, and launching the campaigns. It's like three steps, and you can go live. This. Obviously, stub steps to each one of those, but the basic steps are build the list, create the messaging, reach out, launch the campaigns, set them up and reach out. One bonus step is, and something that these brands would have probably not have had to do in a while, is pitch the brand itself. So obviously you need to have a really good e-commerce store and you need to make sure that it converts well enough. You have the product pages, the content on the product pages and all that. But maybe up until that point, you've never had kind of like a product deck, you know, demographics presented yep. in a nice way because, and, and that's the question. And that's what we need to, you know, what, what's the sale taking place at this point? The sale that's taking place at this point is promising someone that if you put my brand in your store, you can, inc you can increase your average cart or I'll drive more people to your store simply because yep. you have my brand. And if I have, you know, yep. a page on my website saying, where can you find brand X, Y, and Z, people are going to go to those stores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's quite a lot of trustability to your brand as well. Yeah. If you're already in physical yeah. locations. Yeah. We can, we can, okay. We can play what are the rules the when it comes to messaging? Different, uh, different level of the game. That's, that's what's interesting. Okay. Interesting in this case. This is golden and you, you have three, three to four steps, lists, messaging, reach out, and then maybe have a pitch deck inside yeah. of that as well. What are your rules when it comes to building a message? How is an e-com brand? Because like D2C and your communication with an end, end consumer is completely different from, 
your right. messaging to a business owner who wants to make more money. Because exactly. I'm buying a product because I like it, because I like this T-shirt. Uh, yeah. But I don't buy this as a business owner. 100%. So the first one, the the email communication, if you know, I, and I don't want them want to call both of them email marketing because email marketing requires consent from the recipient. It's targeted yep. towards direct to consumer audiences, private individuals. It's illegal to reach out to someone unless you have consent, at least in Europe and with CCPA in California. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reasons, you don't want to go there. Cold email yep. is a completely different thing. Cold email is something you reach, you know, you reach out to business people, people uh, that are part of a business. Who have a specific role in that business and you have a specific intent and a specific use case uh, and a reason to reach out to that business it's pretty much like saying you know i found your you know company card and i reached out that's it you need a reason for that you need consent no you don't so you know i'm and i'm saying this right now beforehand because there's, there's always the, the question of like oh how legal is this you know yeah. let's let's get it out of the way you cannot you know block email as a channel from communications when you're talking b2b so um, when you're talking to an e-commerce owner or when you're talking to, you know, to, to, to a business owner or a business person in general, you don't want your email to look like an email marketing communication. So cold email is formal, but it's also semi-formal or not formal at all in the sense that it's just plain text email. <laughs> so it's really yeah. easy to put together if you know what to say. And it's also, also really easy to tweak and optimize. Again, because there's no HTML involved, you don't need an email editor. It's as simple as opening up your Google Workspace, Gmail, whatever you're using, typing the email yeah. and hitting send. And you just do that through a software that allows you to do that hundreds of times a day and you don't have to do it by hand. Yeah. Okay. Um, how do you make sure that you're not getting spammy with this? How do you make sure that people get yeah. you to so, get to really like what, what they're seeing? Okay, the, the basic one, which is something that people that have not written any cold emails before are going to stumble upon is the what I call me, me, me uh, versus you, you, you. So me, me, me is like, I am the founder of the business. I did this. We do this. We do that. Our product does this. Our product does that. If you can avoid the me, me, me and instead, and this is like marketing 101, but for some reason we yeah. tend to forget about it. So if you of can course. instead focus on them. so. I noticed that your store is in that location, or I noticed that your store is featuring brands A, B, and C. So, and, and this is what I'm giving right now is like the formula for a cold email. And it can literally be as simple yeah. as that. The first step is an observation about them. I noticed X, Y, and Z. You're in this prime location. You have one of my favorite brands that no one knows of, but I'm a big fan of, which is X, Y, and Z. Or I noticed you sell fishing products and we provide fishing hats or we provide fishing nets or it might be something else. So the yeah. first step is an, is an observation. Then you okay. want to have something that's tied to that observation, which can also be a soft pitch for your brand. So, and then you can maybe use one me or one we. We do this X, Y, and Z, or we do these kinds of products. And I thought they would be a really good fit given what we discussed above, given A, B, and C, because mm -hmm. we have similar audience. Um, yeah. If you have any, you know, brand recognitions uh, have gone to Shark Tank, which you probably haven't been, yeah. let's say you have, but let's say you, you know, have an amount of customers that you can drive, have an email list, have active channels, because at the same time, you have to think about in many ways, your business is their dream. And in many ways, their business is your dream. What do I yes. mean by that? Having a thriving retail location means that you probably don't have an e-commerce store, right? And, and, and vice versa. Yeah. If you have an e-commerce store that's doing really well, you want the physical location, but you don't have the funds to build it because it's a completely different game. And it's just a matter of like how you've prioritized your energy. So if you can give them the, the outlet that, hey, we can enable you to turn digital sales and we can drive a lot of people and a lot of traffic to your store simply with one email, because we know the address of everyone who's purchased from us. So anyone who's in the, let's say, 100 mile radius will reach out to them and will let them know that our products are not available in your store. And we'll do a promotion, we'll give you a code, we'll give you a discount to launch that. And maybe we'll spend, I don't know, $500 on like a launch party the night of. So give them a good enough reason why your brand deserves to be inside of their store and how your brand, more importantly, how your brand can increase their sales and how it complements their existing products. And end with a CDA. 
two different types of CDAs you can test. The old school CDA that does not work anymore that well in B2B sales, but might be the case here is let's jump on a call and discuss. Yeah. Another one, which is a really easy one to use, and we call it like a soft CDA, would be something like, would you like us to send you our product brochure or product catalog so you can have a look? Really easy. Wasn't that the old way? Wasn't that something that we were doing like five, six, seven years ago and then everything went into, okay, let's have a call, let's have a call, let's have a call. And now it seems like it's, people are so tired of hearing about let's jump on a call that they're back to let, send me a presentation, please. Yes. Yeah. So you have to look at, you know, channel saturation and how people use different channels and what's kind of like the go-to practice. And that, and that also changes based on the industry. Like if you reach out to like any, any B2B business right now, uh, let's jump on a call is not going to work. So we focus on other things, either providing value, asking to share case studies, asking to share materials, asking to share guides. And like, you know, if you're, an, if you're let's say, uh, an agency, a recruitment agency, here's a guide for how you can automate your recruitment process using cold email, let's say. That's something that yeah. we would use as sales captain. So, yeah. Yeah, you can experiment with the CDA, so that's like not the, the end thing. And then other tips to not being spammy, I call it the mom rule. So talk to someone like you would talk to your mom. You wouldn't try to fool your mom. You didn't, wouldn't try to scam your mom. You wouldn't include too many links to your mom, right? And you would keep it to the yeah. point, including only as much information as you can and ending it nicely. So the other link, the other, the other rule is no links, maybe besides one link in the email itself. No yeah. links. No attachments unless someone has explicitly asked you or you've yep. gotten permission to share something. Not because there's a rule about it, but because it becomes, it devalues what you're sharing if you're just reaching out and attaching something. And then yep. always, if you're sharing any assets, never share them as a plain file that you've attached to the email. Always use a tool like Relay2, it's a, it's a really good tool to use. We also use doc.us. And these two tools allow you to create one link for every individual person you're reaching out to after they responded. And that way you can mm -hmm. track whether they visit the document, you can have messaging on the document itself, you can include different types of information. So the, the entire sales process can flow through yeah. that. And it's very personal this way. So it's not just a, hey, here's it, here's like a brochure. It's like, hey, this is my personal stuff that I'm allowing you to see. Exactly. It's a much better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So from your experience, like what are the steps for the e-com brands and who are doing this? Uh, who has done this in a smart way from your experience? You've seen those in at World Pro. Who did this the right way? Uh, there's a few interesting, and I'm not going to mention names, but there's a few interesting CBD brands, uh, CBD okay. drinks specifically, that are doing this in a, in a really interesting way. Um, uh, one of them I think is Brez. Uh, it's by one of the speakers, Nick Seckleford. I think they, they started as, a, yeah. as an e-com brand and they're also expanding to retail. I saw some screenshots, like he didn't, obviously I'm not aware of what they did in the back end, but I saw some screenshots of their product being available in, uh, in physical locations. And especially you know, with a product like that, that definitely uh, makes sense. But I also know that they sell online as well. So yeah, this is one of the brands I'm looking at. And Nick is a really smart e-com marketer, e-com guy like he's. He is. Yeah. We've been trying to get him on the podcast and he promised and then he didn't do it. So we'll probably follow up with him a, a few more times. He's busy. To, he's busy, but he's a really, really nice guy. Yeah, he, he, he is great. Okay. So, um, if you're there, you you've done the seven figures, you're starting to become good. You're starting to make, uh, to make some really good money to, um, and what's, um, what's your next steps as an e-com store owner? To, to really grow this? Yeah, I'd say one of them is, again, looking at retention and reactivation. So mm -hmm. you definitely want to make as much money as you can from your existing channels and existing customers before you go on the long journey of, you know, trying to build something from scratch. Because, yeah, we're talking about mm -hmm. a new channel. We're talking about a new way to make money. It's going to take time to grow. It's going to take funds. It's going to take your attention. It's going to require building new skills. And I think the next level is starting to build those partnerships with other businesses that can cross sell your products. Okay. What are your favorite sales tools that you're using for e-com stores? If I'm doing this, what are the tools that I absolutely need to have in my okay, I'll give you, I'll give you one. Uh, 
especially if, you, if you're in the U.S. market, and this is something that has been available for the last month or so, and it's actually free. Okay. It's called rb2b.com. It shows you the companies that are visiting your website. Now, if you're in, and only it only works in the U.S. If yeah. you're a commerce store owner, you might say, "Why would I need that?" But think about what kind of businesses or stores or brands are already inside your website and they're purchasing, or they're just checking out your products and not purchasing, that instead of trying to go cold on people and brands that are not aware of you, you actually reach out to the people that are already on your website. So our B2B takes it a step further. That's why it's crazy. It, it doesn't just give you the companies. It gives you LinkedIn profiles of the people visiting and the email That's, address. It sounds illegal to, to have that. <laughs> I know. I know. It sounds so time. good. It's, it's not illegal to have. It's they're, they're, I think they're back from Nathan Latka. Um, it's, a, it's a really smart CEO. They've, they've exploded. And obviously, B2B brands are you know running to, to add them to their website. If e-commerce brands do it, that's where it, get, it becomes a growth hack. Oh, wow. Imagine okay. that's, for that's our a huge clients one. and our brands. We, and you said it, the way it works, they have integrations. So you can add those people in your CRM or automatically connect, mm -hmm. but the free version, you set it up on Slack and you receive real time notifications when these people visit your website with their LinkedIn profile, photo, business email address and company name, URL, these are the easy things. Yeah. Crazy. Crazy. Okay. I think that I'm having some, some homework to do <laughs> right after the podcast <laughs> uh, with, uh, with this one, but that's, that's amazing. What else would you use in more traditional yeah, fashion? Yeah, so we use that to identify who's visiting the website. Now, when it comes to list building, which you know, because with uh, with B two B, you have to understand yep. you have you know the data yep. infrastructure, you have the tools, and you have the outreach. Uh, we use Clay or Apollo for the data. Clay, yep. we've actually almost replaced we, with Clay, and that's a crazy story for maybe a different time. We replaced a team of twenty five people who were doing manual list building with Clay, yep. and the data expert. It was like as as simple and as crazy as that. So it was able to save us a ton of money on payroll costs. Uh, that's the okay. first one. It's really good for building prospect lists and enriching the data. Otherwise, you can use Apollo. You can use D7 Lead Finder. There's other tools, but they definitely don't compare to Clay. Uh, Clay. The other one that Clay allows you to do, if you don't, if you're not doing it through Clay, there is tools like Better Contact that also do the same thing. It's is called waterfall enrichment. When you're trying to guess a business email, it matters a lot if in a, in a list of like 1000 people, you can get 90% of those emails and you have them, you can have them correct. So most, most tools, most pro prospecting tools like Lusa, Apollo, etc., will only find the percentage of those emails. So what waterfall enrichment does is the process of testing out different tools, and this is done automatically until you're able to find a valid business email, one of those tools. And it kind of like runs in a whirlpool in the sense you try the first one. Did we find the email address? Yes, done. We don't have to use the, the rest. So it goes like that through the entire list. And you can increase your email finding rates from literally 60% to 70% to like 80 or 90%, which is crazy. Uh, that's the first one. And then when it comes to email sending, we are big fans of Lemlist. We've been like partners since um, it was still like a startup at Station F doing their AppSumo launch. I think I might have a few licenses. How do you spell this? Lemnus. Lemnus. So Lemnus does cold email sending, LinkedIn connections, and allows you to orchestrate the campaign. Lemnus is where I put the list of store owners and my copy, and it does the sending. Mm -hmm. And it makes sure okay. there's another add-on, which is almost illegal. It should be legal, but it's not. Uh, it's called Lemworm, which is included as part of their tool, which is a process of warming up your email account and allowing you to reach the inbox. So yeah. remember how with email marketing, we only reach the promotions tab or the marketing folder? Yeah, with yeah. Lemlist, your emails go to the inbox tab. So they're actually there front and center. So if your subject line is good enough and if your, photo, if your profile photo and name don't look or sound creepy, people are going to open your email. Yeah. Yeah. So the chances of you converting literally are like, do you have good data? Because you're able to go to their, to, to get to their inbox. And then if your messaging is not crap, we know that they're going to check out the website and that's the other secret. So we know that when you reach out people before they respond, they're going to go to your website. This is what, where our B2B is, is interesting because 
you can then compare yeah. the original prospect list from the people who visited the website to the people who visited the website and then you're able to tell okay it works perfect now what type of a person should be what <laughs> what type of a person should be in charge of uh, um, of this process and what's the skill set that they need to own yeah i mean it could in theory be an email marketer it's not that complicated it does have a bit more of a technical element because cold email requires multiple inboxes to run so one more tool that we use is we use actual we used to use google accounts up until february of 2024 when google became much more strict and started like blocking cold email accounts there's multiple other solutions we use one called mailforts so within mailforts Mail mail for it yes to reach out to, yeah, okay. to reach out to 3000 prospects in a month which might be a high enough number but still is a benchmark yeah. and having four emails sent to those people so being able to send roughly 12000 emails a month you'll need 10 to 12 email accounts so you'll need to buy two to three other domains typically using namecheap for that and then you mm. need to connect, you need to create two to three inboxes per domain and set them up with Lemlist. So Mailforge is the, the tool that we use to create email accounts. We then connect them to Lemlist and then Lem Lemlist coordinates the sending. Okay. This is so kind of like basically, so as an, so as an e-com store owner, um, I want to get a person that's like having something to do with sales or something to do with email yeah. marketing. Exactly. I, I give them basically the summary of what you just said yeah. and they start doing this. What are the benchmarks? for e-com stores that we should be looking at? How many people should we um, outreach or how many businesses yeah. should we outreach? And what's a normal like open rate? What's a normal reply rate? What like so that we can then calculate and see how much money we can do out of that? The, the, the first one and, and to kind of add to what you just said, you either need it for, for the person that you're going to recruit, you either need a salesperson who has high enough digital skills, who has done this before, mm -hmm or you need an email marketer who's eager to learn a new channel because there's definitely challenges yeah. and, and new things. However, I think cold email is like a drug for email marketers because as email marketers, what's what's an average open rate that you'd say is like good enough? Maybe 25, I don't know. Yeah, do you, do you wanna guess like what an average open rate would be for a cold email? I have heard that, I have heard some new guys that they say that they can get like up to 50% um, percent sometimes. But I would say that when I was doing code email with my agency years ago, it was probably around 10. We typically see 60 to 80 percent open rate. OK, <laughs> so that's something that's like impossible to do with email marketing for exactly. with your existing customers. Yeah. Just to give you an idea, we don't have a big nurturing list for sales captain because the number of prospects we talk to is, are not that many. When we want to do nurturing yeah. campaigns, we don't do them through traditional email marketing tools. We use Lemlist and cold email because we want to make sure yeah. that even the follow-up and nurturing emails end up on their inbox. Obviously, in our case, you know, it's a B2B audience, so we're talking to them in like, you know, as a human would. It's no email templates and stuff yeah. like that, but we want to yeah. make sure we reach the inbox. Now, in terms of KPIs, open rate, there's there's different schools and different theories that you shouldn't be tracking open rate. So if you are tracking open rate 60 percent or above or around 60 percent is a really good benchmark because that's going to differ depending on the company size. If you reach out to companies above thousand employees, you typically expect that to be between 40 and 50 percent, maybe 55 percent. If you're reaching out to smaller companies or local businesses, 60% is definitely a good benchmark because especially if, and that's a, that's a big, uh, mm -hmm. big there, asterisk there, if you reach out to actual people from the business and not reaching out to the info at or support at business because that's that that was my next question. How do you bypass the customer support? You don't reach out to them. Yeah, but yeah, when you go to those websites, you, you use Apple or, or whatever, you typically get the office at or support at so, so or your yeah, or your tools are doing the, that for you and that's the old school so the old school tools was a tool called hunter.io you go to a website yeah and you find yeah hunter would find you those info at emails those don't work anymore so the way we do it is we'll go to the website get the company name or get the url and then either go to apollo and find one of the founders or one of the marketers head of marketing whatever title depending again 
uh, or it could be business development partnerships, because if you're reaching yeah. out to a larger company, they probably have those titles in place already. So you have to reach out to those people. So you find those people, whether you do it on LinkedIn or Apollo or Clay, you can do it through that as well. You find their mm -hmm. business email and then you reach out to two to three people per company. You don't just reach out to one person because they might be on holiday, maternity leave, paternity leave, whatever, busy, breaking yeah. up, you know, you know the deal. Uh, <laughs> you reach out to three to four Leaving people. the company, yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Depending on the size of the company. And then it's, you know, it's an iteration game. You see how they respond and then you go back. So another metric that's really important, you can, you can, you can track reply rate. It should be between three to 6%, depending on what three you're Three to getting. six. Yeah. So it that means that out of 100 people, maybe 60 to 80 open, and out of those, three to six reply. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And the, the reply rate itself does not say much because we don't know if it's a positive or not. Typically, we go for like, you know, 1% positive replies out of that. Mm -hmm. But a better rate is what we call like engagement rate, which is the number of positive replies from the total replies you received. Compa compa compared to the total replies. Okay. So okay. receiving replies by itself, you might receive 100 replies, but if people are you know, giving you the middle finger, it doesn't really do much. Yeah. So you want those replies to be positive. And having an, what, what we called like engagement rate, which is that, that percentage of like, you know, total email, email replies received versus uh, positive ones gives you an indication of how well you're doing your job. What should be that? 25% or above. 24 or more. Okay. So one of, yeah. one of four, one of one, uh, one three of, would one be a good one. should be a positive one. Otherwise you're doing something wrong. And then one of my favorite games, and this is something like I, I coined at some point is what I call like the cold email replies audit. And I call them the good, the bad and the ugly. Good replies are the positive ones, are people that want to book a call with yeah. you, that want to move forward, it makes sense, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, the bad ones are people who are really giving you the middle finger like they they respond yeah. back and say unsubscribe stop this is yeah. spam you know this is terrible yeah. what you've done wrong yeah. in that case because in in the good replies you don't really need to change anything if you're mostly receiving good replies you're good to go oh, i need to stop doing the thumbs up uh yes. there's a person here and it doesn't work well with my macbook the the the, the bad replies they're not the worst kind of reply you can get. The bad replies are the second worst type of reply you can get, the, 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 the second worst, because it means that your audience is wrong and probably your messaging is wrong as well. So your targeting is off and maybe your messaging is as well. Yeah. Uh, so you need to look at both. You, need, you start from messaging because it's easier to tweak. You do some A-B testing, you test um, the CDA that you have, and if it doesn't improve, then you discuss changing the targeting as well. And then the worst kind of reply you can receive is the ugly replies. And I call them ugly because it's typically people who say, not interested, not right now, you know, not a huge fan. It's kind of like the people who go like, meh. And the reason this is an ugly response is there's not much you can do about it. It typically means that your offer or the way you're presenting your business is not hot enough, is not, is not hooking them enough for them to respond mm -hmm. positively. So. You know, it's not terrible, but it means that you have to pitch your business a different way. It means that people are resonating. They're not saying unsubscribe, stop spamming, this is irrelevant. What they're saying is you're not hot enough. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good thing that you can change your email hotness by changing your copy. You, you, can, you can be a relationship builder for I can. I have, I have a dating for... funnel. Like I have a dating funnel. I'm not kidding. You have a dating one, okay? <laughs> then maybe that's for another po podcast episode. Yeah. <laughs> it's the number of people that you, you know, cold email or cold message on Instagram, smaller number of replies you're going to receive, smaller number of re people are going to go out on a date with you, end up at home with, et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe one of them you get to marry. Isn't it a funnel? <laughs> Yeah, I know. <laughs> Maybe if she falls for your funnel, then that's a red flag, but that's, that's another <laughs> story. I, I, I better not show this podcast to like people I'm, I'm interested in dating. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll hide that from them. <laughs> just let me know. Um, but yeah, jokes aside, um, I think that you just right now basically summarized um, what all e-com businesses should be looking at. So when we were discussing prior to this podcast, a potential topic, and we were discussing, hey, 
there is a huge misconception that like growing an e-com business is just through ads. Yeah. And um, and then you started you you started educating me on B two B, in that uh, in that sense. So, um, if I can summarize this, I can say, hey, ecom guys, whatever you're doing, you now need to go and do some B two B and uh, do some cold emailing and start building relationships with. It can be it can be uh, retail stores. It can yeah. be either e-com stores that could be reselling your products and you can do all of this like it's limitless at this yeah. moment uh, at this time um so that's that's quite amazing and uh, we always have in the podcast we, we have a few questions that are a little bit more personal and related to uh, exactly to your business uh but as someone who is quite young and is doing so well and is like so smart as you um how how did you get to the place that you are today? What got you to hear uh, that it was different from the people that became copywriters and were already and and are still copywriters, or to the people that maybe were video editors and are still video editors? Um, you that you started from the same spot. What did you do different? What was your hack? Undiagnosed ADD, self or self-diagnosed okay. ADD, uh, child. Okay. <laughs> Childhood trauma and uh, the um, the eagerness to prove myself, and a lot of mm -hmm. curiosity. And this is the way I like. This is like the way I personally operate. Probably the trauma, hopefully, is gonna not gonna be part of the equation for long. But I've always been curious. Like, how does this work? How can we make it work? What are the variables that you know change? And Elon Musk calls this um, the foundational principles, I think, or something similar. If you if you identify how something works, let's say we discussed marketing, right? Like it's it's messaging, audience, channel, cold email. It's like five things, you know. Uh, the recipe inside of the cold email. It's another four things. So if you're able to break break things down to their core fundamentals and then build them back the way that works for you, then you're able to optimize pretty much anything you come across. That's why you know. We've had success with paid ads. I had success recruiting speakers for AdWorld, which I hadn't done before. I had success doing interviews. Yeah, it took me a while because I had to, you know, uh, hone in my interviewing skills. I did like 50 interviews or however many. Uh, the last ones, I was more, you know, more natural questions were like, you know, I, I, I needed less preparation. I had built that. The other thing that comes along with it is I get really bored from repeat, from doing repeat processes. So I'm like, a, I'm the worst person to like do something consistently that's like a repeatable process that you know is optimized and you know that works well like it's painful for me so that naturally pushed me to the place where i was always testing out new software i was always eager to learn i was always eager to say okay how does this work uh we have a new problem okay how do we solve it but then once we've solved it we don't need to repeat it we don't need to keep making the same mistake let's grow a step further so it's like at every different stage I was eager to understand like how do these things work and how can we scale you know uh, above that level and i think the biggest issue is this it's it's what i mentioned before it's like what kind of problems do you enjoy solving do you enjoy battling the yeah. same boss again and again maybe you do and maybe you want a variation of the same you know uh level maybe you have you have other interests maybe you know the copywriter i mentioned he's also doing pole dancing so he liked pole dancing. He liked, you know, ending his day-to-day -day job at 5 p.m. and going out and having yep. drinks with friends, which is completely normal. Normal. Like you have to be some sort of like crazy guy to, you know, to, you know, to want to carry with you your work during your weekend, during the, your days off. I think some people are wired like that. Some people enjoy that. Some people get satisfaction from that. So, you know, I don't know if it's some if it's like an inherent trait. I don't think I ever like wanted to be where I am. I didn't really actively chase it. I didn't want to be like an entrepreneur. It just okay. happened. Like I was an employee. I was like, I'll be head of growth and then I'll be fine. And then I saw the way the agency I was part of was running and I was like, holy shit, like, you know, I can do better. That's, that's how I was yeah. like, okay, why don't I start a business? I didn't think much about it. I just started a business. Uh, and then I was like, okay. So you're always curious. You're just yeah. always curious for new stuff. Yeah. I just yeah. uh, put my lamp on. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So, with this little break on my site, um, that's quite interesting. What are the books that changed your life? What's What's your top recommendations? Top recommendations. I I, I knew that question was coming. 
I knew that my yeah, head for sure. Know, <laughs> and I have no idea. So um, Predictably Rational is one of the books that has literally changed the way I think. I read this a while back. This is marketing by Seth Godin. Like the, it breaks down the fundamentals for how to do marketing. Um, mm -hmm. And then there, there's a few more specific ones depending on, on the skill set you want to hone. I think like these two books, Predictably Rational, which breaks down the the way we think and the way people think and what we think is reasonable or what we think is normal. And then this is marketing mm -hmm. with like two of like the core books. Um, Never Lose a Client. This is a book that I'm finishing reading right now, but honestly, it's like an amazing read both for you know business owners agency owners uh, e com founders like it's like crazy it breaks down how a sale actually takes place from the perspective of the client and what you need to mm -hmm. be doing and we're literally i'm reading the book along with my team and at every step of uh, every 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 after every chapter they have questions for optimization so i'm like we're coming up with ideas and like literally building things um, as we go, but like I have a huge library, I, I make it a goal to read about like 25 or 30 books a year. So it's like, you know, I, I, I try to kind of like pick the next thing that answers the question I have in my head at every given point. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, 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 it's quite natural. I'm not forcing myself to read stuff I don't like. And, um, you mentioned something that, that you're building all of this with your team, um, this habit with your team, how do you make sure that you are engaged with your team and you make the most out of it what are your tools your um yeah your ways of working and making the whole group very effective and efficient i think the first one is you have to understand that they're not there to serve you they're there to make a living they're there to have fun and their day has to end at some point and like yours I had to be really mindful of that because honestly, like, since I was like a teenager, I had the habit when I was part of teams, like 2 a.m., Bill's texting, Bill's coming up with ideas again, Bill's doing this, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think it might have been a, like a pet peeve for people at that point, but, you know, it's being mindful of their boundaries, um, being personal and being friendly and being, you know, what, we had one team member who was like, you know, uh, when is this month's payment coming in? Because it was like a bank holiday in the UK, the payment was like for like a day. Um, and he, you know, uh, called one of my team members who was in charge of finance and asked what's happening there. And because they had done that for like one or two months straight, it was like, okay, I'll call the person, I'll check. Do they have any personal issues? Is, this, is something happening? Do we need to change something? So yeah. I went straight ahead and the guy said, no, I have no, actually, I have no problems at all. I was just checking in. I was like, okay, but if you need anything, let me know. So we try to yeah. you know, engage with them on a personal level, understand that, you know, they might have other interests or that their desire to be part of the business might change. So we try to make it a win-win situation. Like we get the best out of their work and then they get the best out of the business, which is, you know, and then you have to understand what drives each person. It might be fulfillment. It might be the opportunity to interview Seth Godin. It might be visibility. It might be more money. Uh, it might be the eagerness to grow. So you have to understand what drives each person and be able to provide that to them on a personal level. Being friendly and being like a human being to others I think love plays a big role into that in, in the way you run your business, in the way you treat others. Uh, and you can do it for, for selfish reasons as well is because it comes back to you. Because if you take care of others, they also will take care of you. One of my biggest anxieties of like running a business was payroll and was having the responsibility of others. That was it. Mm -hmm. I know that it's not a prerequisite to start a business. You don't have to care about the people, but this has been kind of like the was one of my greatest pains at some point because it was like the 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 well-being of these people depends on me like if we screw up yeah that's true these people and their livelihood is ruined and maybe i'm being a bit dramatic but i think it's like having that mindset and then you don't really have to care i honestly think that and i, I try to remind myself that again and again if you have a goal or if you have a set of principles that you operate under you don't have to overthink about the day-to-day -day. you can just trust in yourself that you'll operate according mm -hmm. to those principles and those principles yeah and then you'll do it because i'm like you know I, a lot of times i used to be hard on myself about how do we grow the business and how do the and like you enjoy growing businesses that's what you do like naturally so even if the business is not growing at the rate that you want keep an open mind take a step back relax try to identify what's the actual level that i'm in right now what do i need to learn and what obstacle do I need to overcome, which I might not be realizing because I subconsciously might enjoy playing this game or mm -hmm. I might go. It's exactly the same thing with the relationships and past trauma. You keep repeating the same behavior until you you learn to recognize it and let go of it. Yep. 
And yep. that's where having business mentors, where having you know a network and people you're talking to really comes in handy. Okay, and um, I typically don't ask this question to, uh, to my guests, um, but I think that this is going to be a good opportunity because I think that many people are just like me in the same place, they own an e-com business, they maybe get stuck at some point or they don't see the growth that they used to see in the first months or a year or two. Um, how can people reach out to you and what can you be help? How can you help them actually? And can you help e-com? Are you helping e-com businesses? Yeah, so definitely like any mark, anything marketing and sales that I can be of help with, even if it's just having mm -hmm. a chat, like I'm, I'm more than happy and, I'm, and, and it keeps me sharp as well. Like I'm part of growth mentor and it's like a platform where I, like I do mentorship for free. Like there's a fee to the platform, but like I do it for free and I don't get paid. I'm yeah. like, I had someone ask me, why do you do it? And I was like, I enjoy it. It's fun. And I'm yeah. not telling people go sign up for a growth mentor. You can message me on, on LinkedIn. I don't, you know, it, does, it doesn't change anything, yeah. but I'm saying like I, yeah. it genuinely motivates me and it fuels me. Um, so if, if anyone wants to reach out, yeah, definitely more than happy. And that's it. I, I, I take great pleasure in that. I have two parents. My, both of my parents are teachers. So I think deep down something in me wants me to be like in that position where I'm like constantly presenting something coming up with a problem, building kind of like the solution and then kind of presenting this and sharing the wins. So yeah, that's, that's a bit inherent with me, but yeah, anything, anything growth and B2B, uh, it's, it's what I enjoy doing. So it brings me a lot of pleasure, honestly, you have to be Amazing. mad to start a business. You have to be yeah. mad to an extent. So yeah. I am mad enough. Uh, Alex Hormozzi calls it like a, a kick in the nuts. He's like, <laughs> that's what running a business is like. Everything is, is amazing. You're flying high and then you get kicked in the nuts. And, you know, it happens again and again and again. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I found another common thing. I'm a, I'm a mentor for five seasons in a program here in Bulgaria uh, called Mentor the Young. So it's a, it's a great one and I take quite a lot of pleasure doing this. Yeah. And I might be full of work, but I, every single time I continue to sign up for it and uh, give give some of my time two hours a week of my time yeah. uh to help out uh, someone that's between 18 and 25. so um one thing that i uh, wanted to see what's your vision like where where are you in the next years what will make you fulfilled in your opinion at this moment i think it's um building a family through the businesses that we're building um I was not lucky enough to have like the best kind of relationship with my parents and, and the rest of my mm -hmm. family growing up. So I know the pain of not feeling, feeling accepted, not feeling welcome and not, you know, actually having love given to you openly. And I think we're building sales captain with that in mind, like how can we make it turn it into that? And ultimately, I think the, the vision for that business is, and as far as we can see, is turning it into a venture studio. So we've been doing this long enough we're building ways to go to market. That's why we actually call it. So if you can help any business go to market, it doesn't make sense to stay as like an agency. It makes a lot of sense to have your own products or brands that yep. you are, you know, in, that you've invested in and you can help bring them to market because that's what we're, what we're good at. And I'm genuinely passionate about building, you know, more businesses and being part of that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm really crazy about it. Now, what comes next? I have no idea because I still have a few different levels of the game to master. Uh, but that's that's that. And then on a personal level, like I'm, I'm more keen than ever to continue, you know, experimenting with like, okay, different different things that can change your perception of reality can change your perception of things. Um, and, and the way you think and, and growing as a person. That's it. It's uh, I, I watched uh, the movie Lucy again for the yeah. second time about two weeks ago and one of the things that it says it's like uh, an, an organism has two modes of operation uh, the first one is reproduction when things are going well we reproduce and then when things are not going well it like strives for like infinity which is like you know you you, you know you work um, to get out of that situation and the only meaning in life the movie said is like the cells act as one organism and it's to preserve knowledge and to transfer mm -hmm. knowledge so at some point I was like, fuck growing the business. I'll yeah. try to do the best I can. And if I can pass on something to the next generation, if in the process we end up building something better and may leaving the world in a better place than you know it was when we found it, I'd be more than happy to solve a few problems, make some money, make some new friends, build um, you know, a family in the process. 
and just have fun. That's it. You're going to be doing this for a long time. I don't believe I'm ever going to get, you know, a retirement uh, or anything like that funding or that no. there's money for retirement, no. at least not in Greece. So, you know, I intend on working <laughs> Oh, way to trust yeah. your home country um so yeah <laughs> i want to have fun in the process like that's it uh you, you brought up lucy i i honestly saw it probably i don't know it's probably 10 years ago i don't know when lucy came out um but it was a it was a shocking movie back then with it was a brain fuck movie for sure yeah, I'm, I've never asked this on a, on a podcast, but what are the let's say, and that that'll probably my my last question because we've gone over the hour. Um, but what are the your most memorable movies that taught you the most, or like definitely gave you some really good uh, food for thought after that? Uh, Lucy was one of them for sure, uh, and I didn't expect it to that extent. Another one was Limitless, uh, which is. And and you can tell like there's a pattern in the kind of movies I like. Like how can we expand mm. the brain? What happens when you you know unleash that? Um, and a few more existential ones. Uh, I cannot I cannot remember most of them right now. But it's it's been about movies that change like perception of reality. I'm a big like science fiction guy. So anything that challenges kind of like the status quo and the way we think and perceive things is really good for me because it acts like food of food for thought because entrepreneurship at the end of the day is like imagining and then trying to build something that doesn't exist and there's a lot of friction and there's a lot of people who have motivation for things to stay as is from your employees to the rest of the world mm -hmm. to naysayers to actual established companies out there so anything that helps me you know cross kind of that is is really valuable because it keeps reminding me of that thing it's like the way it is now and the way it works now is not the way it might work in five or ten years. Fantastic. And um, the last thing that you, if you, if you can give one line of advice to seven and eight figure e-com store owners, what would it be? I, I think it goes back to what I said before. It's, you know, if you want to grow and you don't have to grow, you can, A, you can choose to be satisfied where you are and continue doing what you're doing. There's other things in life that you can explore other than work. Mm -hmm. So you have the opportunity, you're in a place where you can actually do that. So that's one path you can take uh, or sustain what you've built. Another one is if you're focused on growing, don't do the mistake of beating yourself up because a lot of the things that you have been doing to get here to here won't get you there. So understand that, accept that. Don't beat yourself up. Realize that you're going to have to be in a different game where you'll be the junior guy again, where you'll be talking to people who have built, you know, nine plus figure businesses for whom you're going to be just a kid, quote unquote, a kid in terms of like your experience in business. Similarly to when I started mm -hmm. my business, people who are making two to three million were like five or six or seven, step, seven steps ahead. And, yep. you know, we would have a different conversation to what we do now. So yep. be okay with that. Be fine with that. If you're okay with that, it's going to work. That's, that, that's it. And if you can find mentors and friends that accompany you in the journey and allow you not to make the mistakes that everyone else is doing and save you some time and some effort in the process, yeah, it's going to massively help. Amazing. Well, Bill, first of all, thank you for being part of the, the podcast. I think that we built uh, something really good here that... Uh, I think that actually every single e-com store owner can take advantage of this. Like we've had episodes where people talk about, hey, we had Carol Weiss talking about CRO. Of course, it was like really helpful, with, but we have topics that can help out certain types of uh, e-com stores. In your one, I think it's something that's valuable for everyone and that we should shift our perspectives a little bit because we're typically stuck in one place. We're stuck in one mindset. And we don't see all of those opportunities that are out there and they're quite easy. You just have to follow the steps. So um, thanks everyone for watching this episode. Um, subscribe to our channels or wherever you are watching or listening to this or you're seeing our reels. Um, so follow us and follow Bill as well throughout his journey because I'm sure that in the next few years we'll be seeing much, uh, much more and new stuff coming out of him. Thank you, guys. Thanks, man. Really appreciate the invite.